So today we will be looking at the small intestine meridian. So the full name of this meridian is the small intestine meridian of the hand Tai Yang. So from the name we know it's a hand meridian and because it's a young meridian of the hand we know it travels from the fingers all the way up to the head. And because it's Tai Yang it's going to travel the most posteriorly of the three hand young meridians. This meridian has 19 points in total and the common indications between points are for pain of the head and neck. So this is because of the flow of the meridian traveling along both the head and neck. And then secondly, it can treat conditions of the ears, nose, eyes and throats. And this once again is because of the flow of the meridian, which we'll talk about in detail in the next slides. And then the third and fourth indications for debrile diseases and mental disorders this is because of its interior exterior partner, the heart. If you think back to the heart slides, the heart meridian can be used for both febrile and mental disorders. And because these two meridians are linked, this meridian also has actions on conditions that are affecting the heart and therefore can be used for febrile diseases or mental disorders. And then finally, it can also be used for other regional diseases. So this is referring to any diseases along the flow of the meridian from the hand all the way up to the head. Now let's look at the course that this meridian flows. So this meridian starts at the tip of the ulnar side of the little finger. So if you think back to the heart meridian, remember that that also ended at the tip of the little finger, but it was on the radial side instead of the ulnar side. So this is the difference to note between these two points. Then this point descends along the ulnar side of the dorsum of the hand. So this is the ulna side and this is the radial side and it ascends up the ulna and dorsal. So the dorsal is this portion. And then from the dorsal aspect of the hand, it passes the styloid process over here and then continues ascending all the way up to the elbow where it passes between the olecranon of the ulna and the medial epicondyle of the humerus. So if you look at this image here on the right, this one, this is the olecranon here. And this is the medial epicondyle of the humerus. So it's going to pass between the two like this. So that's the flow of this meridian. And then it continues ascending up the posterior and lateral aspect of the upper arm all the way to the shoulder. And then from the shoulder, it zigzags along the scapula region. So this is the zigzag I'm referring to, this up and down motion it makes here. And then from there, what it does is it moves medially to connect to do 14 yeah, on the upper back region. This is do 14 here. Yeah. And then it loops back towards the anterior portion of the body over here and enters the supraclavicular fossa, which is this fossa over here. From here, it has two branches, an ascending branch and a descending branch. So the ascending branch rises up the neck, past the jaw to the cheek. At the cheek, it splits again with one branch traveling towards the outer canthus of the eye and then to the ear. Next, we're going to look at the branches on this meridian. So there are two branches we will talk about. We'll talk about the supraclavicular branch and the cheek branch. So the branch I've called the supraclavicular branch is because this branch occurs just superior to the clavicle in this region. And what happens is it branches from the main meridian and descends down to connect with the heart its Zhang Fu partner. From there, it continues descending through the diaphragm to the stomach and then connects to the small intestine, its own organ. And then the second branch at the cheek up here, so what happens with this branch is it ascends from the cheek to the infraorbital region, like this green arrow here, and it ends on the medial end of the canthus of the eye, whereas the normal part of the meridian went to the outer canthus. And if we look in a bit more detail on how the other pathway flows, is it flows from the branch up to the outer canthus, and from the outer canthus, it moves more posteriorly behind the ear, circles around the ear, and ends just anterior to the tragus of the ear. And then the frequently used points on this meridian, so these are Shao Tzu, small intestine one, Ho Shi, small intestine 3, Yang Lao, small intestine 6, Xiao Hai, small intestine 8, Tian Zong,
small intestine 11, and Ting Gong, small intestine 19. So the first point we're going to talk about is Xiao Tse, small intestine 1. This is the Jing well and metal point of the meridian, and it is located on the ulnar border of the little finger, 0.1 sun proximal to the base of the corner of the nail. So we'll first find the posterior border or the base of the nail, which is over here. And then we're going to find the ulnar border of the nail, where these two meet. That's the corner of the nail. And then we go 0.1 sun away from that. And if you think about the heart meridian, remember what we said. That one is on the opposite part of the little finger over here. And then this point can be used for mammary abscesses, pupural lactation insufficiency, coma, sunstroke, and febrile diseases. It can also be used for headache, corneal cloudiness, sore throat, and other diseases of the face and five sense organs. Our insertion is a perpendicular, shallow insertion, or we prick this point to cause bleeding. And then remember the caution here, this point is contraindicated in pregnant women. Our next point is Chen Gu, small intestine 2. This is the Xing spring and water point of the meridian, and it is located on the ulnar border of the little finger, in a depression distal to the MCP joint. So remember MCP stands for metacarpal phalangeal joint, which is the joint between the metacarpals, this bone, and the phalanges up here. So we're going to be in a depression distal, which means away from the center in this direction. So we're going to first palpate for the MCP joint, and then we're going to move this way to find a depression that lies just distal to it. And usually this depression is much easier to palpate when the hand is made in a loose fist, like in the image on the right here. This point can be used for febrile diseases, mammary abscesses, hypogalactia, headache, eye pain, tinnitus, sore throat, and other diseases of the face and sense organs. Our insertion is perpendicular, 0.3 to 0.5 sun. And then one thing to think about here is if you think about this point, small intestine 2, and the next point, small intestine 3, can you think of any other points that we've done recently that had a similar location to these two points? So the similar points I'm referring to is large intestine 2 and 3, which are found in a very similar manner, except we were using the second MCP joint instead of the fifth MCP joint. So they were on the radial aspect of the hand instead of the ulna aspect. But everything else was similar. Both we had to find the MCP joints, and then we, for, for two we had to go distal, and for three we'll go proximal to the joint. The next point is Hoshi, small intestine three. This is a shoe stream and wood point, as well as a confluent point of the governor vessel. This point is located on the ulna border of the hand, in a depression proximal to the fifth MCP joint. This point is located at the end of the transverse crease of the palm, lying between the red and white skin when a loose fist is formed. So if the patient forms a loose fist, what you'll see is that this crease here will actually go towards where this point is. It's a bit different to how this image is showing. And then what this refers to is that this point is at the end of that crease, at the junction of the red and white skin. Just like those other points we talked about, that junction between the red skin on the palm and soles and the other color skin on the dorsal aspects of the foot and hand. And then what we do is we locate the MCP joint once again, and we're going proximal, so towards this direction from that joint. And this point, like small intestine 2, is easier to locate if a hand is made into a loose fist, which will make the depression more prominent. So the indications for this point. So firstly, this point is a confluent point of the governor vessel. So what that means is that it can treat conditions on the small intestine meridian, but also conditions on the governor vessel, which is another name for the do meridian. So what does this mean? Well, in practice, this makes this point very effective in treating pain and stiffness in the neck and head. The reason why is because both the small intestine meridian and the do meridian run on the back of the neck and head, and therefore this will amplify the effects if we use this point because It'll be the same as using a point on both the do and the small intestine meridian. Whereas now we can just use one point and treat both those meridians. This point can also be used for pain of the back and loins for the same reason and spasmodic pain of the elbow, arms and fingers. And that's more due to the normal flow of this meridian. 
Secondly, this point can be used for deafness, redness with swelling of the eyes, and it can be used for epilepsy and insanity, and fourthly, for malaria. And the insertion for this point is a perpendicular insertion, 0.5 to 1 sin, or there's actually a secondary insertion we can do, which is a through needle insertion, where we needle from small intestine three over here, and we use a much longer needle, a two needle, and we needle towards either large intestine four or three. So this would be about four would be around here and three would be here. So our needle would be in this direction or in this direction. The next point is one gu, small intestine four. This point is a yuan source point and it is located on the ulnar border of the hand in a depression between the base of the fifth metacarpal and triquital bones. The point is located at the junction of the red and white skin. So firstly, let's break down what they're talking about here. So the base of the fifth metacarpal, which is the same bone we've been working on, would be going to this end now. That's the base. And then the triquital bone, if you see in this image here on the right, it's highlighted in red. It's this bone over here. So that would be over here in the image. You cannot see it completely as the fissiform bone is slightly in front of it, but it's this bone here. So we're going to be in the depression between these two bones. And then the final thing to know where along this line we should be, we have to use the junction between the red and the white skin. This point can be used locally for contracture of the fingers and pain in the wrist. It can also be used for rigidity of the nape with a headache. And then secondly, for cloudiness of the cornea. And then also for jaundice, febrile diseases, and malaria. Our insertion is perpendicular, 0.3 to 0.5 cent. The next point is Yang Gu, small intestine 5. This is a Jing River and fire point of the meridian. It is on the ulna border of the wrist and it's in the depression between the head of the ulna and the triquital bone. So similar to small intestine 4, except instead of using the MCP bone, this bone here, we're now actually going to use the ulna bone. So here's the ulna and we're going to the head of the ulna, which is this portion and then that same triquital bone, and then we need to be between these two bones. This point can be used for swelling of the nape and chin, pain on the ulnar side of the arm, pain in the wrist, and other pain syndromes. It can also be used for headache, vertigo, tinnitus, deafness, febrile diseases, and epilepsy. And when they refer to headache here, what you'll note is you'll see various points can be used for headaches. And how we usually treat headaches is we break down the different types of headaches in various ways. And one such method to differentiate between different types of headaches is upon which part of the head the headache is on. So for instance, if the headache is on the occipital region, which is the back of the head, we call this a Taiyang headache. Whereas if it's at the front of the head, also known as a frontal headache, we'll say that's a Yang Ming headache. And then if it's on the side of the head, like in the temporal region or the parietal region, we call that a Shaoyang headache. So when we use points from the different meridians, we will pick points based on which type of headache we think it is. So if this patient was presenting with a headache at the back of the head, then we'd be much more likely to use this point as it specifically treats Taiyang type headaches. And then finally, our insertion is perpendicular, 0.3 to 0.5 sin. Our next point is Yang Lao, small intestine 6. This is a Xi cleft point of the meridian. It is located when the palm of the hand is placed on the chest. This point is located on the dorsal aspect of the head of the ulna, in a cleft level with the radial aspect of the high point of the styloid process of the ulna. So what this means is that firstly, we're on the dorsal aspect of the ulna, which is this part over here. And then what will happen is that if you rotate the palm of the hand towards your chest and then palpate into this region on the dorsal aspect, what you'll notice is that a cleft develops in this region here. And you can palpate this cleft over here. And then this point is thus in this cleft. And then Yang Lao can be used for poor vision, pain in the shoulder, back, elbow and arm. And our insertion is either oblique insertion, 0.5 to 0.8 sun towards the elbow, so that's in this direction. Or we can use moxibustion on this point, as it is a good point for maintaining health. And do you remember the other point we talked about, which was also good for maintaining health? 
So the other point is stomach 36. The next point is Jijeng, small intestine 7. This is a Luau connecting point, and it's on the dorsal aspect of the forearm on a line connecting small intestine 5 to small intestine 8. 5 sun above the dorsal crease of the wrist. So what we will do firstly is we'll locate the small intestine 5 up here, and then we will locate small intestine 8 down here, which we'll talk about how we locate that point in the next slide. And then we're going to draw a line like this between these two points. And then if we want to find out where along this line the point is, what we've got to do is we've got to go 5 tsun superior to the transverse wrist crease, which is this crease over here. So if you think back, the distance from the wrist crease to the cubital crease, which is over here, is 12 tsun. So how we locate 5 tsun is we divide this distance in half like this, and all we have to do is go one sun distal from this line. And then how you would locate that one sun is that you could eyeball the distance by dividing the distance from the wrist crease to this line here in the middle and divide it into six equal parts. And then this point will be one of these parts distal from this line over here. Our indications for this point, it can be used for headache, rigidity of the nape, aching pain of the elbow and arm. It can also be used for febrile diseases epilepsy and mania and remember the reason why it can be used more effectively for indication 2 and indication 3 is because it's a luau connecting point and then finally it can be used for varicosis our insertion is perpendicular 0.5 to 1 sun so the next point is shao hai small intestine 8 so this is a hersey and earth point of the meridian and it is located on the dorsal aspect of the elbow between the tip of the olecranon and the medial epicondyle of the humerus. So what this means is that we've got to first go to the elbow region. So this is the bones of the elbow over here. So this is specifically a right elbow. So here is the medial epicondyle of the humerus over here. And then this is the olecranon, this bone here. And then where we're going to be is we've got to be between the two bones. So that means the point will be in this region. This point can be used locally for spasmodic pain of the elbow and arm. It can also be used for epilepsy. Our insertion is perpendicular, 0.3 to 0.5 sun. And if you think about the anatomy of this region, the bone lies deep to this position. So that's why our insertion is only 0.3 to 0.5 sun. Our next point is Jian Jen, small intestine 9. This point is on the posterior aspect of the shoulder one sun above the posterior end of the posterior axillary fold. So that means we've got to find this fold here. Yeah, this is the posterior axillary fold. We've got to go to its end, which is about here. And then we go one sun directly superior to this point. This point can be used locally for pain in the shoulder and arm and motor impairment of the upper extremities. It can also be used for scrofula. Our insertion, so once again, think of the anatomy in this point. There's a lot of muscles in this region, so our insertion is deeper. It's 1 to 1.5 sun. Our next point is Nao Shu, small intestine 10. So this point is on the posterior aspect of the shoulder, directly above small intestine 9, Jian Jen, that's the point we just did, in the depression below the spine of the scapula. So if we look at the image here on the right, so here's the spine of the scapula, firstly. Okay, and then here is small intestine 9. So what we've got to do is we've got to go directly up from small intestine 9 in this direction. And then where to stop is that we've got to make sure that we're in the depression below the spine of the scapula. So what we'll do is we locate small intestine 9. Then we move all the way up to the top and palpate for the spine of the scapula up here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to palpate downwards from here until we get into that first depression which lies below this. This point is used locally for pain in the shoulder and arm, and it can also be used for scrofula. The insertion, once again, we're going into the muscles of the deltoid, so we've got a bit of muscle to work with here. And then we're also angling in towards the joint of the humerus and the scapula. What we're going to do is we can go a bit deeper. That's why our insertion is perpendicular, 1 to 1.5 turn. Okay, so in this slide, what we're going to do now is we're going to get a bit more familiar with the anatomy of the back. 
And this is because the next few points require you to use this anatomy to locate these points. So firstly, let's go over how you locate the borders of the scapula. So now I've just overlaid both the scapula and the vertebra as well as the ribs. So what you're going to do is to locate the scapula, there's a few things that we can palpate on our patients. So firstly, we can palpate the spine of the scapula, which is this part here. We can also then palpate the medial border, the lateral border, and then where these two points meet, it's known as the tip of the scapula or the inferior angle of the scapula. So once you have located all of these points, it forms a triangle like this. And then once we know how to locate the scapula, the next thing we need to do is be able to count the individual vertebra. And when we count the vertebra, usually what we talk about is the spinous processes. So what these are is if you see this image I've just brought in, when we refer to the spinous process, it's this part here of the vertebra. So this is from the superior view and here from the superior lateral view. So this part is the part that you can palpate on a patient. So when we refer to the spinous process of T1, it will be this part here. Okay, so now how do we locate the individual vertebra? So the first thing we do is let's get rid of this image. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to palpate from the top of the neck downwards like this arrow shows. And the first palpable vertebra is that of C6. Then the next vertebra after that is C7. This should be more palpable than C6. So it should stick out slightly more than C6. And how we differentiate between C6, C7 and T1 what we do is that we place the index finger and the middle finger on either side of the spinous process and ask our patient to look left and right. And if they look left and right, both C6 and C7 should be felt to be rotating slightly with the head, whereas T1 will not rotate. And then once we've done that, and then once we have confirmed where T1 is, we count T1 to T12 down from this. And then from T12, we can count L1 to L5. From below this. If you look at the image, the red dotted line with the arrow is the cervical vertebra, the turquoise type arrow is the thoracic vertebra, and then the darker turquoise color is the lumbar vertebra. And then there's one or two anatomical structures we can use to assist us in counting it, otherwise it'll take us very long to count down to L4 when we want a needle near L4. So what we do, we use the inferior angle of the scapula, and this is usually level with T7. And then we can also use the superior iliac crest. And this is level with L4. So these various markings help us count the vertebra much quicker. See, for instance, if we're going to count the vertebra from C6 all the way down to T45, it's better to first locate C6, C71, and then count downwards. Whereas if we need to locate around T5 all the way down to T12, it might be better to use the inferior angle of the scapula, locate T7, and then count up or down. And then for locating the lumbar vertebra from L1 all the way down to L5, and then also the sacral vertebra, these are all better to use the superior border of the iliac crest, and then go inwards and find L4, and then either go up or down. And then in the next slide, what we're going to talk about here is the surface anatomy of the lungs. And why this is important is that if you know when you're looking at your patient where about the lungs lies on them, this will make it a lot safer for you when you're practicing so you know which points you need to be very cautious of your depth and which points you can start doing perpendicular insertions as puncturing the lungs is no longer a risk. First thing you've got to think of is where is the apex of the lungs? This is the highest point of the lungs. Then you've got to think of where is the lowest border of the lungs? And then where does the parietal pleura run? So if we look at this image here, this is going to give you an idea of where about these three aspects are. So firstly, when we do the anatomy, we talk about three different positions. Firstly, where the lung is at the midclavicular line where the lung is at the mid-axillary line, 
and where the lungs run posteriorly. So that's on the back. So the apex of the lungs, as you can see in this image, it runs all the way up to the sternal end of T1. So the sternal end is referring to be level with where T1, so the first rib, and where that connects to the sternum. Next, let's talk about where does the lower border of the lungs run. So what you'll notice in this image is that the lungs run to about here, whereas the parietal pleura runs all the way down here, which is much further down than the lungs. So the first measurement we'll talk about is that of the lungs. So at the midclavicular line, so that's at the front of the body. Remember that line we found, which is Fort Soon lateral to the midline. So we found the lateral end of the clavicle, the medial end, and we go to the midpoint and we follow that down. That would be on the front of the patient, not on the back like in this image. But at this line, the lung runs all the way down to T6. So that's the sixth rib. And then at the mid axillary line, which is around here, we can't really see it on this image, but it's around there. Remember, we have to find the anterior axillary crease, the posterior axillary crease, and midway between them is that mid axillary line. At this point, the lung reaches even further down to T8, so the eighth rib. This is the eighth rib here. Yeah? And then at the posterior aspect of the back, it reaches all the way down to T10, which is this region over here. Now, you may be wondering, why does the lung reach further down as we go from more anterior to more posterior. And the reason is, if you look at the ribs here, what you can see is that they start high up. Like if we follow T8 over here, this is the eighth vertebra. Now, if you follow this rib, look what happens. It goes all the way down. And if we look at it where it is in the mid axillary line, if we follow that line back to the midline, look, it's actually level with T11. So because of our structure of our ribs, they go from their highest point at the back to their lowest point at the front. So that is why these numbers vary as we go further posterior. The next measurement is the parietal pleura. Where does that run? So what you do is you just take the measurements I've told you now and you add two ribs to each of them as the parietal pleura runs two ribs lower than where the lungs run. So at the midclavicular line, it would be up to T8. At the mid axillary line, it'd be up to T10. And at the posterior part of the back, it would be up to T12, which is all the way down here. And then you may be wondering where to measure on the back. So we usually measure around here, this region here, which is at the medial end of the scapula. And then you may be wondering why we need to know where the parietal pleura runs. And this is due to something we call pneumothorax. So what is pneumothorax? Well, this is another word for a collapsed lung. So if you see this image I've brought in, as you can see here, the lung on the right-hand side is normal. It's fully filled the whole chest cavity, whereas the lung on the left is much smaller than the space allocated for it. The reason why is that there's air that's gotten into this space, and this space is known as the pleural space. It's the space between the lungs and the parietal pleura. So the reason why we need to know where the parietal pleura is, is that if we puncture the parietal pleura, that's where the true danger lies. Because once we've punctured it, this means air can start slowly seeping into the parietal pleura, and it will slowly start filling up the space like this. And each time the patient breathes out and the lungs shrink, more air will be allowed to come into the space and therefore make it harder and harder for the patient to breathe in and expand the lungs. As the more pressure forms here, the less the lungs can expand, as it will be very difficult to push the air back out of the space. So that's where the true risk actually lies. Now we're going to move on to the next point. This is Tian Zong, small intestine 11. So this point is located on the scapula in the center of the infraspinous fossa at the junction of the upper and middle third of the distance between the lower border of the spine of the scapula and the inferior angle of the scapula. So you see on the image on the right, we first over the scapula region, then we palpate first for the spine of the scapula here. Yeah? We go to its midpoint and we go to the lower border, which is around here. Yeah? Then we palpate for the inferior angle of the scapula, this point here. Yeah? We take this distance from here now 
and here, we divide it into three equal parts like this. We've got to be at the junction of the upper, which is this part, and the middle third. So where they join, which is this region. And then whereabouts on this line, we've got to be in the center of this fossa that's formed here. This point can be used locally for pain of the scapular region, supraspinatus tendonitis, fasciitis of the muscles in the shoulder and back, and other disorders of the local area. It can also be used for tachypnea. Our insertion is perpendicular or oblique 0.5 to 1 sin. And you might be wondering how come we can do a perpendicular insertion? Isn't this too close to the lungs? But if you think about it, when you know the anatomy, this gives you the answer. If you think about what's here, the lungs are in this region, but because the scapula is here, it protects you from damaging the lungs because you'd have to go through the bone of the scapula to get to the lungs. And this is why we can do a perpendicular insertion. The next point is Bing Feng, small intestine 12. So this point is also on the scapula and it's in the middle of the supraspinatus fossa, directly superior to small intestine 11, Tianzhong. When the arm is lifted, this point is at the site of a depression. So what will happen is when the patient lifts their arm, especially in muscular or thin individuals, a small depression will form in this region. So that will help us to locate the point. And then what else we've got to do is we've got to first locate small intestine 11 over here. And then we can go directly above this. And then what we've got to do is we've got to find the middle of the supraspinatus fossa. So here's the supraspinatus fossa, this part here. And we've got to ensure that we're in the middle of it, which would put us in this region. The indications for this point, it's all local functions. It can be used for pain of the scapula, numbness and aching of the upper arms and other diseases of the upper extremities. Our insertion is now shallower, but still perpendicular, 0.5 to 0.7 sin. And you can see that because the lungs are running more here, that's why we can still go perpendicular. But our depth is much shallower because depending on individuals, there might be slight variations. The lungs might be more like that, or our angle might not be completely perpendicular. So for safety, we go a bit shallower here to reduce the risk of puncturing the lungs. Our next point is Chu Yuan, small intestine 13. So this point will require you to use that anatomy we talked about in the earlier slides. So this point is located on the medial extremity of the supraspinatus fossa. And it's about midway between small intestine 10 and the spinous process of the second thoracic vertebra. So now we have to use that technique we talked about. We've got to count downwards, locate T1 over here, locate T2, which is over here. This will be the spinous process. It'll be a round bump you'll feel over here. And then we locate small intestine 10. So we draw a line like you can see in the image and go to the midpoint. That's where this point is located. This point is used locally for pain and stiffness of the scapular region. Our insertion is perpendicular 0.3 to 0.5 tin. And because this point is near the medial end of the scapula, we do a much shallower insertion. As you can see, it's 0.3 to 0.5 tun. As there is a risk of puncturing the lungs if we do a deep medial insertion, so that means towards this direction, as you can see, then we would bypass the protection of the scapula and can go into the lungs. And even if we do a perpendicular insertion, this bone here can vary in patients. So we go much shallower to reduce our risk of puncturing the lungs. Our next point is Jian Wai Shu, small intestine 14. This point is on the upper back, three turn lateral to the lower border of the spinous process of the first thoracic vertebra. So remember, we said we're always going to be using the spinous processes when we're counting the vertebra. This time, we're going to go to the first thoracic vertebra, this one here. So the same method as the previous one, we palpate downwards, locate C6 here, locate C7 over here. Then we ask the patient to turn the head left and right to confirm that that's C6, C7. Then we count one down to T1. We go to the lower border of T1. So that's the lowest portion here. And then we're going to go three tsun lateral to this. And how we locate three tsun lateral is that if you remember from your location lectures, the distance from the spine or the posterior midline to the medial border of the scapula, which is this portion, is three tsun. 
So then we just have to locate the medial end of the scapula, join this line with the line from the lower border of T1 over here, and where these two lines meet is small intestine 14. This point can be used locally for aching of the shoulder and back, pain and rigidity of the neck. And these are all local functions. Our insertion is oblique, 0.3 to 0.7 sin. And remember here that there's a caution against perpendicular insertions as these carry a risk of puncturing the lungs. And the reason why we have a caution against perpendicular insertion is if we look here at this image I'm drawing, if this is the surface of the skin, and we insert a one sun needle perpendicularly, it will go about, let's say, that distance. But the same one sun needle when inserted obliquely would only be this length, and therefore it would go only to this depth. So as you can see, there's a lot less depth compared to a perpendicular insertion, and therefore much safer as we have less risk of going to a depth where the lungs are sitting. So if the lungs were sitting about this deep, like here, then you can see the oblique insertion is well above this, whereas the perpendicular insertion may puncture them. So that's why we do an oblique insertion, and it can be medial or lateral, depending on which condition we're treating, whether it's the aching of the shoulder, the back, or the rigidity of the neck. Our next point is Qian Zhong Shu, small intestine 15. This point is on the upper back, Tutsun lateral to the lower border of the spinous process of the seventh cervical vertebra. This is also where DU14 is located. So our location is the same as the previous point. Palpate down, locate C6, C7. We go to the lower border of C7, which is over here. And then we draw a line from this point like this. And then what we do is we locate the medial end of the scapula over here. From here to the midline is three tsun. We divide this into three equal portions like this. And then this point is on the outer third. So yeah, this line. And where this line meets the line from C7 is where this point is located. This point can be used for cough, tachypnea, hemoptysis, and then locally for pain in the shoulder and back. Our insertion is an oblique insertion medially 0.3 to 0.6 tun. And once again, the perpendicular insertion carries a risk of puncturing the lungs. And that's for the same reason as the previous point. Firstly, we said that the lungs runs all the way up to T1. So yes, T1, so they would be in this region. And remember, the perpendicular insertion goes much deeper, whereas if we do a bleak insertion and we go medially, which means this direction, as you can see, we're going towards the spinal column, and therefore there's much less risk of puncturing the lungs because we're going towards where these bones are. Our next point is Tian Chong, small intestine 16. This point is on the lateral aspect of the neck, on the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, posterior to large intestine 18, Fu Tzu, level with the laryngeal prominence. So as it says, we find the laryngeal prominence, this point here. We go lateral to this, and we're going to keep going lateral until we get to the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, which is this muscle here, and this is its posterior border. And then the point is located just posterior to this border, which is over here. This point can be used locally for sore throat and sudden loss of voice. And it can also be used locally for stiffness and pain of the neck. And then it also has other indications such as those of treating deafness and tinnitus. The insertion is perpendicular, 0.3 to 0.7 sun. And we must remember, similar to large intestine 18, there was a special caution when we needled large intestine 18. Does anyone remember this caution? So remember that the carotid artery is close to this region, so we must be extra cautious when we needle any points in this region here, as they all carry a risk of puncturing the carotid artery, so we must be very careful and ensure that we know where the carotid artery is running in our patient. For instance, if it's running in this region here, then we locate it and then ensure that our direction is not angled towards the carotid artery, and if you look at this image here, this shows the carotid artery. So if we think about where the sternocleidomastoid runs, it would run in around this region here. So if we followed the laryngeal prominence to its posterior border, we'd be just about here. The next point is Tianrong, small intestine 17. This point is on the lateral aspect of the neck 
posterior to the angle of the mandible in the depression on the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. So we first locate the angle of the mandible over here. This is the angle. Then we're going to locate the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid over here. And then we're going to palpate just anterior to that for a depression around this region. And that's small intestine 17. This point can be used for sore throat, swelling of the cheek, deafness, and tinnitus. Our insertion is 0.5 to 0.7 sun. And if you look at this image I've just brought up here, what you can see is it's an overlay of the muscles that are in this region and then where the carotid artery runs. And you can see it over here. This is the carotid artery, this one here. And you can see it runs just superior to where we located this point. So that's why we've got to be cautious here and ensure that we're not needling into the carotid artery as it does run in this region. And then our insertion is perpendicular, 0.5 to 0.7 sin. The next point is Qian Liao, small intestine 18. This point is located on the face, directly inferior to the outer canthus, in the depression on the lower border of the zygomatic bone. So firstly, we locate the outer canthus, this part here. We draw a line down from that. And then where along this line this point is, it's in the depression on the lower border of the zygomatic bone. So as you see this image here, this shows the zygomatic bone, this bone here. And we've got a palpate for it, and we're going to be on its lower border, which puts us just here. This point can be used locally for facial paralysis, twitching of the eyelids, pain of the face, toothache, swelling of the cheeks, and yellowing of the sclera. There are two types of insertion for this point. Firstly, a perpendicular insertion, 0.5 to 0.8 sun, or a oblique or horizontal insertion, 0.5 to 1 sun. And in the second method, we could use the through needling technique, needling towards any of the other points that are local to this region. These are points such as large intestine 20, which is over here, the stomach points, stomach 2 over here, stomach 3, or stomach 4, which are all in this line. The next point is Ting Gong, small intestine 19. This point is on the face, anterior to the middle of the tragus and posterior to the condyloid process of the mandible, in the depression formed when the mouth is open. So let's break that down, that's quite a bit. Firstly, the middle of the tragus. So the tragus is this part of the ear, yeah? So we've got to be at the midpoint. So that's the midpoint like that, that line there. Then we have to be posterior to the condyloid process of the mandible. So if we look at this image here on the top right, here's the condyloid process of the mandible, this bone here. So that means we've got to be between the condyloid process and the tragus. So our condyloid process would be running about here in the patient. And then it's in a depression formed when the mouth is open. So if we look at the bottom right image, this one here, what you see is when the mouth opens, the condyloid process shifts forward and a depression is formed over here. And then this point is in that depression but we still got to locate the tragus over here. Tragus would be like this, so that we can get that midpoint of it. And then we'd follow that line anteriorly to get to this point. This point can be used for deafness, tinnitus, and otorrhea. It can also be used for motor impairment of the mandibular joint, which is this joint here. And then it can be used for toothache. Our insertion is perpendicular, 1 to 1.5 sun, with the mouth open. The reason why we can go much deeper is because when you open the mouth, that condyloid process moves out of the way, giving us a nice depression where we can needle into. And that's the end of the small intestine meridian. Thank you for watching.